one other commercial uh, we got a, a few months ago and quite interesting. So this is uh, Abel Moshe's Manihot or the uh, South Sea Aunt Lil's salad tree <laughs> from, from the South Pacific. Actually, they're native all throughout Southern Asia and to the Pacific Islands. And it is a hibiscus relative. It is closely related to okra, and it is really highly, widely used in cuisine in the Polynesian Islands, as, and as well as Philippines and everything. So the book says when you cook it, it gets mucilaginous like okra does. So we thought, well, maybe not be that good for fresh eating, but we, we've been eating them, and very similar to lettuce. Very, very similar to lettuce. <laughs> I mean, doesn't have any sign of any sliminess at all. Um, it's like a real <coughs> thick, thick lettuce. These are perennial plants that uh, can die to the ground in the winter to frost. It's kind of like the southern hibiscus type plant. And then they grow back from the roots, get about six or seven foot tall, big, creamy, uh, hibiscus like flowers with dark centers. Um, so interesting plant. So they use it a lot uh, for food, food and ornaments. So another nice ornamental edible. And they're in our herb section over here. Okay. And what did you? Uh, what was the name right there? Abel Moshe's Manny Hops or on the the variety because most of them have more deeply cut leaves, look like maple leaves. This one they're more rounded. But it is Aunt Lil's salad tree. So, uh, um, and my daughter was in Fiji last month and took pictures of it over there. So it is something they use a lot. You need to grow in pots. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You might need a large pot since they can grow six or seven foot. But a surprise to us. We didn't think it was going to be as good. Even the internet. You know, some of the articles say it's really good, and some say it's okay. But apparently, it's what you cook it with. But, uh, but you can eat it raw. Yeah. yeah. Okay, today we'll be talking about some of the real important Mediterranean fruits, um, figs, and pomegranates. To them become widely popular in the Mediterranean. They're both, though, native to Asia, or evolved, let's put it that way, evolved in Asia. So fig trees, uh, all the ficus family of figs evolved in Asia, uh, more or less tropical Asia. The fruiting figs, which can be grown in the temperate climates, warm temperate climates, uh, they think evolved in western Himalayas. So. And then uh, we're certainly taking one of the first uh, fruit trees cultivated by man, taken all around the world uh, eventually, but certainly throughout the Mediterranean region, they became real important. Now, figs, there's more than one type. We just, for our use, we just carry, quote, the fertile female, the self fertile female. But if you grow figs from seed, and birds do that all the time, you, you know, by your next year block walls or fences, uh, figs come up from seed constantly. And it takes them maybe five to 10 years to start fruiting from seed. Uh, and you, there's different types you can get. So the one type would be uh, self-fertile females. <coughs> the other type would be um, called a capra fig. And there are other types too, but these are the main ones. So I've grown a lot of volunteers. In fact, one of our best selling figs, the Gary Strawberry fig, was the first volunteer in my house to, well, not the first, but the first one at my last house that I lived at to make fruit. And it was one, at that time, it was the best fig I've ever eaten. So we've been selling that one for the last 10 years now, 15 years, and it's become quite popular. But half the 
figs I've grown, capra figs. And capra figs uh, have not only the female parts of the fruit in there, but they also have the male. So, you know, if you know what figs look like inside. <coughs> the figs are close to like the mulberry, so they're like the mulberry and it's inside out. So usually the inside has a lot of uh, juicy, I guess you call them little berry sacs that fill up the entire inside of the, of the fruit. And that's the female. But when you have a male, a uh, capra fig, you've got the male parts in there too. So not only do you have that part, you have a lot of fuzzy, dry stamens with pollen on them. And they said the only people, the only animal that eats those are goats. So they call them goat figs or capra figs also. Um, and there's also figs that will harbor, um, there's insects like little wasp, uh, I can't remember the name of the wasp, is it capra wasp? But uh, the, that pollinate figs, and uh, they live inside the fig, and their maggot larvae also live in there. So you, when you can get a seedling fig tree, it's always good to slice it open, slice the fruit open when it makes fruit, and see what's inside before you take a bite. So I have uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that happened is back in the 80s, someone said, well, I have this volunteer fig and it doesn't taste very good. I'm going, well, I got an idea, bring it in, show me the figs. So they brought in the fig, typical, you know, most of them turn out green. Typical fig, sliced in half, washed it for half a minute, and the inside was starting to wiggle. Oh, God. So I said, okay, I don't think you want to eat these. So, uh, so about half of them turn out to be edible, and in, in my case, one third of the ones I grew from seed turned out to be excellent. The other two were okay. So that's what happens when you grow from seed. Generally, they don't fruit when they're young because they're babies, so they have to mature. And by maturing, that means they have to get at least six or eight foot tall, sometimes even 25 feet before they start fruiting. So uh, it may be a waste of time to grow them from seed if you know only half of them make, you know, less than half make good fruit. So, uh, but still, it's always exciting to do it, because you never know, you might get something really wonderful, and that's how most of these came about anyway, is they were just, uh, figs are usually the mutations of other figs, or uh, something wonderful happens from seed. Now, <clears throat> the typical fig tends to grow about 20 foot, and there are dwarfer ones too. And generally, what to know about fig trees is they produce fruit on new growth coming off of one-year-old wood. So on, well, let's just take one of these. Better to show it than draw it. So on this particular tree here, this trunk's about four years old. This branch starting from here, going all the way up to the top, is just one year old. So this grew this year. Grew about three foot this year, which is not much for a fig, but it's in a pot, so it's stunning it. And you can tell it's the, the current year because it's got leaves all up the branches. Um, now this winter, I can cut this all the way back to keep it small, but you can't cut 100% of this branch off. If you cut it down to here, it doesn't kill the tree. It'll make branches out of the eyes or buds on this trunk, but those branches won't fruit that year. And then the branches that grow off of that one year old branch the next year will have fruit again. So on this branch, on this big tree, you cut this branch 99% off, at least leave one node where the leaf was attached to this branch, and the branch growing out of that will have fruit on it. Usually they play it safe and leave two nodes. So, uh, you know, just an inch or so of each branch, you can cut it down to and then grow essentially the same branch back again, one or two branches, and they'll fruit all the way up those branches, like some of these have, they had fruit further down these branches earlier and they have already matured and fallen off. <clears throat> now, figs, what they figs do too, is that at the ends of the branches, some of these figs, now this one, they're all going to finish before winter, unless it grows some more. 
but on some branches, they're making figs. Like on this one, I see little bumps growing, little figs growing. They probably won't have time because we've only got about one month left of growing season left for it's warm enough. So those figs on the end of that branch won't develop this year. If you don't cut this branch off, they'll develop next spring. And that's called your spring crop. It's really just the figs that developed last fall that didn't have a chance to finish. So on some of the, especially on some of the bottom branches that are not very tall, you can just leave those branches and you'll get the spring crop. And then the, the main crop is the one that forms, they call it the fall, but it forms between August and December. Each leaf that grows past July seems to have a fig attached to it. Yeah. And those will ripen from August all the way through uh, till December. Some figs have a shorter season. There's a few figs that have figs for just about a, two months, and then they're done. But some figs will go all the way into winter. Now it turns out, you know, a lot of books say they need they require less than 100 hours of chill. Figs don't require any chill at all. Uh, they just shut down when it gets too cold for them. One of our customers took figs to, um, he lives part of the year in the Philippines. So he took a lot of small fish, smuggled them into to the Philippines. He says they fruit year round. They never stop it. As long as they're growing, they're fruiting. Now they have trouble in the Philippines with figs uh, because they have the monsoonal rains. And if it's raining good and the leaves stay wet constantly, they get this fungus on them called rust, fig rust. Uh, when we get rains here, yeah, the leaves get, a lot of leaves get rusted that, that stay wet for a long period, which is a fungus, the leaves fall off, but we usually don't treat them because it doesn't keep raining here. Rain's always real brief, so a lot of times you'll have, a lot, say half your leaves fall off and they grow new ones again and they're fine again. In the Philippines, he says, it can rain for months and months and months, and every now and then, he, he buys new figs to take them back because it kills them. Says when it doesn't stop raining for four months, the fig's pretty much done for. <laughs> so these figs were developed for drier climates, uh, Mediterranean climate where it's dry in the summer and fall, rather than the tropics. But interestingly, yeah, they're warm, like 2014 and 20, the winters of 2014, 2015 were the warmest winters we can remember in the last 30 years. And a lot of the figs did not shut down. They didn't drop their leaves. They didn't stop making fruit, uh, especially Black Mission, which is the one that the Spanish people brought here in the 1500s. Uh, they just kept, they just kept going. They didn't stop. They just kept making fruit. So. Now, when you do see pictures of old fig orchards. A lot of times you'll see big giant stumps in the ground that are this tall with just small branches sticking out the top. So they just prune them all the way back, let them grow, prune back, let them grow. Again, you won't get your spring crop if you prune all the branches back, but uh, the main crop by far is the, uh, the summer fall crop. But the spring crop has the biggest fruit. It definitely has the biggest fruit. Now it turns out that uh, any ficus you can eat the fruit on. Although I'd caution you, again, there might be bugs in them. <laughs> but, the, you know, the regular houseplant ficus is, uh, you make the little berries, and I've eaten those. Uh, so, just about any fig is edible. Okay, um, there's probably about 400 or 500 name variety of figs sold so there's you know it's hopeless to try to collect them <laughs> i had a friend once from italy and he had 40 different varieties in his backyard uh and it just keeps on going i mean you can collect them forever there's a nursery in uh, san Diego county that sells i think they sell 200 varieties of figs it's just crazy so every every area has their local fig we're collecting them. I mean, we've got, this year, we're, currently we have maybe 10 varieties out there. But in our stock, 
of fig trees, we probably have over, we, we have somewhere over 20. And we have some customers who are fig fanatics that buy figs on the internet and grow them, uh, and then give us plants to, to try out of ones that are really famous around the world. Now, truthfully, we've eaten all the ones that are listed at the very top, and when you eat them, they're good, but they're not that much different than the best ones we grow here. So it's not like, you, you know, they're interesting to collect, but they're not something that's totally up and above better than what we can grow here. In fact, a lot of the places in the world have trouble growing figs because they have too much summer rain, and it turns out that the most popular figs in the world are all small um, and easy to grow, let's put it that way. So anyone can grow them, and if you're in you know, Mississippi in the wrong place, you can still grow it, and it turns out okay, but not necessarily any better than the figs we have here, just better throughout the world. But we're an ideal fig climate here. So on figs, on figs, and they are, in theory, an inside-out flower, you have the fruit, they have an eye at the bottom, a uh, little hole at the bottom of them that is where uh, they were supposed to be pollinated by a wasp. Now, the stuff we're growing doesn't need to be pollinated. But, uh, some figs uh, have the advantage of having an, a closed eye, and that helps a lot, especially if we have a real humid or wet summer, because if you have an open eye, a big hole at the bottom of the fig to let bugs, and sometimes bugs do get in there, and sometimes mold gets in there, you get a mold in there, and your figs turn out really sour, and they smell sour. Uh, so that's, so you have to, so we uh, quit carrying a lot of the open eye figs. A long time ago, uh, white, Cado white Genoa was a real popular one. In fact, you know, in the old days, they only sold three, black, mission, brown turkey, white Genoa, uh, that we can get from our suppliers. But we noticed that the white Genoas were getting moldy every summer, so we quit buying them. They had the big open eyes on them. Um, <coughs> we may stop selling Peter's Honey, which is another famous light-colored fig, because it seems to get moldy too easily, too. There's several things that get moldy pretty easily. So not every year, but, or if you live right on the coast, you have that greater chance. So on figs, there's um, well, kind of three or four categories of figs. Now, I will mention what's interesting about the history of California is in Portugal and Spain, there's a real famous fig called the Smyrna fig. And to this day, it's considered top of the line as far as eating. Uh, they have to dry them in Portugal and Spain, but you can eat them fresh too really large, light-colored figs. The, the skin of them is the color of our the chair is kind of a vanilla-colored skin. Um, and they also have seeds that are not hard, but they crunch when you eat them, which makes it kind of interesting. If you go to Trader Joe's, you can buy dried Smyrna figs. You can also buy, buy dried black mission figs, which aren't as attractive because they're real dark. But the Smyrna figs are I'm always considered the top of the line. And so in California back just before the turn of the 19th century or the 20th century, um, they went over to Spain and the, the, the farmers there gave them budwood to bring back. Now, the way we start figs in general, instead of going from seed where there's always a chance, where it takes longer to get fruit and seeds don't come out like the parent necessarily, it's like your kids, they come out similar but different. Uh, we grow them. Um, from cuttings, which means it's a clone. So on a fig tree, you take a branch, either this year or last year's wood, a uh, piece about three to five inches long in, say, January, just cut it and put it in a sterile potting soil, like our acid mix potting soil. In this pot, you can see the top of the stick we used, big branch off one of our trees um, that grew, you know, pretty big. That and within one year, so this is a young, a young branch in there, but it was about, now piece was probably about five or six inches long. You just stick it in there and it grows and it fruits the same year. So they're pretty easy to grow that way. And that's a clone of the parent. So they gave the California farmers budwood to Smyrna figs 
but they didn't tell them and they needed to be pollinated. So they said for 10 years the farmers in California would seed, their figs start forming and fall off, form and fall off. And they finally went back to Portugal and asked them, well, what's up? So they finally admitted that they needed to have another farm nearby growing a fig that housed the wasp that pollinated the Smyrna fig. So the Smyrna fig has been uh, all, not only highly esteemed, it's also more difficult to grow for a homeowner, it's virtually impossible. So what they do in, in Portugal and Spain is they have a separate orchard that grows the wasps that do the pollination. So the wasps are in the figs, the males and females are in there, they're eating the flesh, and then they're, the babies grow in there, and the males fly out of there looking for females to mate with. Uh, the Smyrna figs need to be pollinated, uh, but they can't support the wasps because they don't have the right structures inside the, there's no uh, pollen bearing structures that the wasps larvae actually feed on. So what they do is they take the wasps, the figs off the trees with the wasps ready to fly out of them and they stick, they said eight, eight figs in a bucket underneath each, each smurda fig tree. So the male wasps fly out of there looking for females to, to pollinate to, well, not to have sex with, and at the same time they're pollinating those Smyrna figs. And they said most Smyrna figs you'll find sometimes remnants of wasp wings that didn't make it back out of the fig tree, but uh, that's part of the protein in there. So anyway, <laughs> Smyrna figs, you have to have two, so um, a little more complicated. The rest of the figs we sell, you just need one, so we don't sell Smyrna figs. But University of California, for 60 years, they wanted to make a fig that was like the Smyrna but didn't need that pollination. And they finally finished uh, this a number of years ago, and it's called the Sequoia fig, which is this one. So this will make big, light-colored figs all by itself. Uh, we've had them around for three years now, and you take the figs and you eat them, you can't feel the seeds, but you can hear them crunching in your ear like Rice Krispies. So it's kind of a, a neat little fig, or a neat big, it's a big fig actually, big flat fig. Uh, but we notice the leaves on these things are actually very large. Uh, at my house I have a tree in a pot and it's making leaves this big. So I mean it's almost big enough to cover. <laughs> now, that's a big leaf. <laughs> So anyway, they said they took six years to make this tree, uh, and now they're done and they disbanded their breeding program. Uh, there's another one that's supposed to be almost as good called Sierra. So Sequoia and Sierra are the two that they developed. Along the way, they uh, developed one called Flanders. Uh, wasn't suitable for what they wanted to do, but they released it to the public because they said it's just one of the best things we've ever eaten. So we do sell planters too, um, because it is one of the best figs we've ever had. At the time they released it back in the 80s, it was the best fig I had ever eaten. So, uh, and my Italian friend confirmed me, says, I got 40 figs in my yard, this is better than anything I've got. So. So anyway, that's the, uh, now, the light-colored figs like this are called the Kadoda figs. And in the Central Valley, Kadoda is everyone's favorite fig. Here it's not as popular, because Kadoda is very sweet, but it needs the heat to make it sweet, to make it really sweet. But it's a, uh, a large, round, slightly flattened, um, kind of greenish-yellow fig. I don't know, greenish fig, uh, but very sweet. Now, Kadoda, and it happens a lot with everything, you know, the name got messed up when it was brought from Europe, because Europe, it's, uh, I forgot the European proper pronunciation, it's Datoda. Uh, I think I messed that up, but it's not Kadoda. Kadoda was the American mess up of the name. It's like Peking and Beijing, you know that thing. But Kadoda isn't the proper name of the fig from Italy, it's something else that's similar, like they messed up the syllables. 
So there's a lot of figs that are light colored and mild and sweet. Kadoda is the family of them. Uh, White Genoa came out of that. Uh, a lot of the figs came from that. Uh, the Sequoia, um, Adriana. There's quite a few figs that are in that line of figs that are mild and sweet. The Black Mission seems to be the exact opposite. They're smallish figs, dark flesh, usually red flesh, uh, firm. Uh, these tend to be juicier, but these tend to be firmer. They're still juicy, but firmer meat, more solid inside. Um, they dry really well also. Even on the tree, they dry well. If you don't want to eat them fresh, we like them fresh better. But they're, you can call them the berry flavored figs. They have a little more acidity to them. They've got uh, a nice blackberry-ish or raspberry-ish type flavor. So the mission fig, uh, and a lot of things very similar to it. The black mission again was brought by the Spaniards. Now one that seems to be indistinguishable except for its height is Violet de Bordeaux, which is a real famous French fig. But truthfully, we can't tell them apart. They look very, very similar. The Violet de Bordeaux, the leaves may be cut a little bit deeper and it's a little more snowflake-like, but that's about it. The fruit looks the same, they taste the same. The main difference is Black Mission wants to grow over 20 foot, Vaud de Bordeaux, hard to get it above six. So much smaller plant. Um, it may be that the Vaud de Bordeaux is the Black Mission that picked up too many viruses along its way. So almost every fig out there has a virus in it. This, the modeling on this leaf, the color on that, shows that it has a virus. Um, now, virtually any fig that's, say, 100 years old or older has a virus. They picked it up. The little mites spread the disease. So Dave Wolfson Nursery, which had, had a lot of complaints about the virus in their fig trees on the Internet, they told us, you know, you can get the virus out of these the same way we, we do get viruses out of. Now, most roses in the old days had viruses in them, too, that made the leaves model like this. And the way they get them out of there is you do a tissue culture. You, you propagate them by tissue culture and since you're only taking a few cells to start the new plant usually the virus is in the you know in humans and animals would be in the blood system in a plant it would be in their sap system but if you just pick off a few cells at the tip of a branch they haven't had any circulation reaching yet so those those cells are clean so they can start a plant that has no virus in it but they said there's so many mites out there, they just catch it again. So they've kind of given up trying to keep the stock virus free. Although any of the younger uh, varieties out there, like Sequoia, will be clean for a long time until the you know mite finds it has a virus in it. So uh, and our like my Gary, Gary strawberry fig, we haven't seen the virus any modeling in the leaves yet because it's only 20 years old. Whereas all of the old figs. When the, when the conditions are bad, either it's too hot, too cold, too wet, um, then you'll see this virus pattern in the leaves, and it clears up when it gets hot and dry. So, this viruses uh, don't like the heat, just like people. You know, the way they cure viruses is they'll take a plant in a pot like this, stick it in an oven, a controlled environment, 104 degrees for 72 hours. So you hear how they clean viruses out of plants. It'll kill some plants, but the plants that survive will be virus-free. That's how we get fevers when you get sick. Kills the virus. So anyway, a couple of strong flavored figs, Bobby Bordeaux and, and Black Mission. And those two are you know, two of the better fig trees. I mean, they both are ones that produce year-round when the weather was not so cool in the winter. Um, so both good plants. Now, a lot of people grow figs in pots, and what we find with pots, they do quite well in pots initially, but figs tend to get root bound fairly fast. Like this has been the pot about three years. We notice that everything's getting smaller on it. The leaves are getting smaller, you know, versus the real big leaves on a young plant. 
the fruit's starting to get smaller, the growth's starting to get shorter, and we know it's root bound there. We pull them out and it's all roots. So we tell our customers, it's good, you know, pots are fine, but every, say, three or four years, start a new plant. Throw the old one away, start a new one, and then away you go for another three or four years, and, and you can do it in the same pot even. Generally, when we take cuttings of fig trees, um, you can do a cutting with, supposedly with one node, but we like to do two or three nodes, a longer piece, cutting about like that, and stick it in the soil. Um, unless we have really weird, hot, dry weather in the winter, you usually you get 95% fake. So they're, they're rather easy. Gary, um, Black Mission, does it have the open? Closed eye. Black Mission, Val de Bordeaux, uh, if it's got an open eye, I'll let you know. We don't, we try not to propagate the ones with open eyes. Although when some pounds my employees drive me nuts, they'll prop, start propagating things and say, not that one. <laughs> Gary, what do you do about those beetles, those big, giant green beetles? Yeah, the big beetles. Um, Can't keep them away. If you stay on top of your figs and pick them before they're overripe, you rarely ever see them. But if you mess up and don't pick them for a few days, yeah, the beetles find them and start eating them, and they'll start eating everything on your plant. Now, fortunately, the beetles can't bite, or at least they haven't bought me yet. You know, they're the big green shiny beetles. Yeah. They're, in, they're related to the scarab beetles that are famous in Europe and Asia. You know, the scarab beetles are, <coughs> especially the bottoms of them, just like metal. You know, beautiful beetles. So uh, a lot of the old Egyptian jewelry was based on what the beetles look like. Um, their larvae eat fungus in the ground. Uh, scarab beetles in Europe are famous for feeding on uh, dung balls of camels. So uh, they, the camels would poop on the ground and the dung beetle would roll up the poop into one big ball and they lay their egg in there and the larvae would eat the fungus that was in that poop ball. But uh, then the adults would come out. So anyway, the adults uh, eat, they can eat anything that's sweet. Uh, figs, they can eat peaches, they can eat uh, uh, rose buds too. So anything that's sweet. Um, I don't know, when we get them there, should we just grab them and throw them away or step on them? Uh, they're pretty dumb if you have 10 hanging on one fig. You can just take a plastic bag and knock them all in the bag and close it up and throw them away. Or you can play with them. You know, my kids used to tie thread to them and fly them around <laughs> in circles. So, uh, Gary, tell the difference between a black mission and a brown turkey? A brown turkey figs are much more bell shaped and they're like black mission, definitely a teardrop shaped fruit. The, uh, This is this bottom one is quote a brown turkey type. I mean, there's there's so many figs in Italy that look like the same fig that no one knows who's selling what. So they've given them numbers like we're growing a quote brown turkey right now that's real famous called the Italian 258. And they brought hundreds over from Italy. They just gave numbers because no one had names in Italy either. Uh, in fact, we got one from an Italian family back in the 80s, and they said, oh, we don't have a name for this. So we, we just called it Italian Evergreen because it kind of looked like that on the, on the Internet. But on the Internet, they also say Italian Evergreen, Brown Turkey, Blackjack. And they all be the same figs, and they may be all different, close related figs. They all look <coughs> the same, taste the same. So we don't, you know, there's just so Please many of them. Is the uh, shape? Shape, texture, so they, they tend to be larger. They tend to tend to split when they're when they're ripe, split open. But they have a tight, big. but they're very tight on the bottom. And the eye is pretty close. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. We're, I thought the um, the mission, the black mission, that it, it was that was one way you could tell the difference. I thought it was more open than the brown tip. I don't know. So we don't seem to get ever get a moldy black mission. So there may, of course, there's more than one strain of black mission going around too. Uh, this black mission is called the Visp black mission, 
and a lot of people prefer it because the leaves are set very close together so you get more food on the branches. They don't, it doesn't make any shorter, but they seem to have more leaves and branches per square per, per foot of length than the other one does. We have a, the regular black missions out there too, it's like six or eight inches between leaves, and this, these are like three inches between leaves. But the fruit seems to be identical, just a mutation. I don't know, I, unfortunately I threw away once because I didn't know any better. I had a black mission that had one branch making bright red fruit. And I thought, there must be something wrong with this, so I knocked it off and discarded it. But uh, that would have been a nice mutation of a black mission with red fruit instead of black fruit. <laughs> but, uh, but the brown turkeys and a lot of the bigger figs, they split open because there's too much flesh. They said the skin is about the same as the other figs, but they develop too much flesh inside, so it cracks open. But they're generally juicier, not as strongly flavored as sweeter. Uh, sweet, juicy, uh, almost impossible to dry them. So but that's the brown turkey family, but there's so many of, of that group too. If you're not getting enough figs, I don't get any on my, on my uh, black mission anymore. Because I'm not feeding it, or it's not getting enough sun, not enough sun, perhaps, or else you cut it back too far in the winter. I didn't cut it at all. Yeah. Now, they can get a disease that messes them up, too. The root disease, uh, nematodes in the roots, you can check that out, too. Uh, nematodes are microscopic worms that get on fig roots. Instead of having what look like spider web like roots just going out from the trunk, you've got what look like strings of knotted, or strings of cottage cheese. All knotted up roots. And we we saw that on one of our figs that stopped producing. And in fact, it stopped growing real well too. Uh, and we're able to cure it by growing grass over the root system for three months. Uh, we've never seen that ridden before, but we know that the cool season grasses, bluegrass, ryegrass, red fescue, uh, are immune to nematodes because the roots put out poison to kill them. So ever since we knew that. Every time we've seen nematodes on either figs, white sapote, bananas, all of you can get nematodes in the root system. Uh, tomatoes can too, but I've never done it on tomatoes. Just take some ryegrass seed, comes up in three days, grow it for three months. We pull the ryegrass back, look at the roots, the roots seem to be cured. So that seems to be the best nematode cure that we've ever seen. I've never seen it written down uh, anywhere, but uh, it's always worked for us. So check that out too. Um, I don't know, you might just have a plant that mutated to be sterile. Well, so some of the other figs we sell, um, and most figs have the same season. Now, there are some weird figs out there. There's one, people ask me about Desert King. Well, Desert King is a, a real weird fig in that it, it's, it makes a spring crop that's really good, but it won't make a fall crop unless those figs get pollinated by another, by the right, by the wasps, say. So generally on that one, you only get the spring crop. In the desert, of course, it's probably too hot to get the fall crop, so it's called Desert King. It does well in the desert because it's got a big spring crop, but that's the only crop you get. So we don't bother to carry that one. We're going to have the bigger crop in the fall. Um, Anyway, some of the other figs, so I noted Flanders. Teardrop shape, it's also one of the berry flavored figs. Um, green with purple veining. And then Gary Strawberry, my own um, volunteer that we sell. A little bit more fig shape, still purple veining, berry flavor. Bright red flesh on both of these, which is kind of nice. Now the panache fig, which is probably the mother of Gary Strawberry, because I grew that in my yard. She also has the tiger fig. A um, little bit smaller, rounder fruit. And it's interesting because when it's developing, it's kind of a creamy yellow with green stripes. And if you turn it upside down, it looks like a hot air balloon. But that one's bright, that's the reddest flesh we've seen in a fig. And 
certain years, you swear it tastes more like a cherry. So it's definitely a, a favorite of a lot of people. This is a panache tree here that's got a crop that's just forming. And you can't see the stripes from back there, but it has striped figs. It's also got yellow stripes going up and down its branches. That's one way to tell it. And, and early in the year, you can actually see vague stripes in the foliage too. So the whole plant is striped. Um, this isn't the only striped fig out there, but we haven't had access to the other ones. There's supposed to be a purple fig that's got vague stripes in it also. That comes from the same uh, panaches, I believe, a French one. Panache sounds French. And then they have other uh, versions that are different colors. But this is one of the most popular figs we sell, the panache. The problem with panache is that it does have an open eye. So I've grown it for 20 years, and two years we lost the entire crop. Too, mold, too humid and cool that summer, and the entire crop got moldy, just gave up on it. Uh, didn't harvest that one at all. But most years, especially if you live further inland, that problem. And it is one, rate, one of the top rated figs of the world taste-wise. I mean, if you don't like figs, you might like this one because it does have a a good berry flavor. Now fig um, will produce fruit in pure shade, so we've checked that out too. Uh, my own, my last house said that most of our fig trees are getting half a day. It's just the way houses are. Uh, but when we had a growing ground in Irvine, we were growing figs in full sun, and we noticed there's quite a difference in the intensity of the flavor when you're in full sun versus half a day or less. We've also grown figs in total shade just to see what happens. We had almost as many figs as the ones in the sun, no flavor at all. So that's the disadvantage of being in the dark spot is that the flavor just gets, it just gets bland. It needs some sunlight to make the energy to make that the flavor in them. Um, one of the more unique figs we've grown is this one, which is called Cold Dead Dom Noir. <coughs> And I believe that's the French for, um, well, what it means, the translation is the figs look like the collar of the old Renaissance dresses, that big puffy collar that they used to have, cold de dame, collar of the lady, and this one is noir, which means black. And a lot of people tell you this one is different. You know, most figs are quite similar. This one, the when it's ripe, the flesh looks like black tar inside. You go, oh, this has got to be, this has got to be um, fermenting in there. And you eat it, and it's not. It's quite good. <laughs> so we do, I have, only have one plant out there for sale. We take cuttings off of these to make new plants. But uh, So we'll have a lot more next year because I have another big plant at my house too now. But that one was quite unique, we thought, among the figs we've eaten. I don't know, I haven't seen this in the top 10, but uh, a lot, there's a lot of internet chatter on it about being quite good, and we do like, we do think it's at least different. I know, at my old house, I had 20 different fig trees. Uh, and my favorite of those back in the, that was in the 1980s, was Mary Lane Seedless. And mainly because it was so different, um, I don't have any for sale now, but someone gave us cuttings from a tree they had bought from me back in the 80s this year. So we have some plants that were starting up again. But this one was a chartreuse greenish yellow. A color that you don't see in too many figs. Very mild and sweet. Uh, and very smooth flushed. And they call it seedless. I don't know why. I think it has seeds. They're just so small. But that one was different at my first house. Now, there are some other yellow figs of note, uh, yellow long neck. Which is one of the largest figs we've seen. Um, it's shaped kind of like this. It's got a long neck on it and a big old fruit on it. 
Uh, the bad thing about yellow almanac, it seems to take forever to ripen. So it's sitting on your plant, it's bright yellow, and it's not ripened, and it's bright yellow, it's not ripened. A lot of animals start eating these before they're ripe. So you, you know, unless you keep the endosome control, you don't get it to see food often, but it's, it's unique in the size and the shape and, and all that. That's a question. Mm -hmm. Kind of dumb. When are they ripe? Just in general. Well, usually uh, when they're not ripe, they kind of stand out straight to the side. So you see how this one up here is just standing out straight out from the stem. Mm -hmm. When they're ripe, they usually hang down. Mm -hmm. So the neck just bends and they're hanging down. But we like, you know, most big fanatics like to wait until the skin gets the little crack lines in them. Mm -hmm. And then you know they're really sweet at that point. So a lot of, most figs, the skin cracks, not, they don't split open. The skin just gets developed crack lines or fissure lines in them. And then you know they're perfect at that point. Of course, if the fig beetles are up there, they're probably right too. Um, some other yellow figs. Um, well, we have out there Italian grandmother, but it's, that's probably not the proper name. But a friend of mine who's Greek married an Italian, his first wife, two wives ago, was Italian. And her grandmother had brought figs from Italy, 19, early 1900s. And it didn't have a name for their fig, it is we call it Town Grandmother. And it's a smaller yellow fig, still big, about this size, not as big as the yellow nong neck, and consistently better quality fruit on that one. So we sell that one too. It's called a Town Grandmother fig. But you know, there's so many. Another light colored fig that's quite famous I have it outside um, white Marseille or it's light color anyway white uh, I don't know how to spell this Marseille something like that uh, it was supposed to be something that Thomas Jefferson brought to the colonies in the 1700s from France he said this was his favorite fig he'd ever eaten, and it did well in Virginia, or wherever, whatever state he lived in. Um, and it's also known as Laterula fig, but apparently the Laterula figs I have there, there, there said the say Laterula aren't the right one because the figs aren't coming out white. That's the problem when you collect figs is that uh, some, sometimes they just get mixed up. Any white Marseille is supposed to be Thomas Jefferson's favorite. Should mention, so we, a lot of companies, instead of growing them from cuttings, this is a tissue culture grown fig. So they come out with a whole bunch of trunks. Um, we got some in from another grower back east, they were tissue culture too, and yeah, they do this, they just want to make a lot of stems, which is kind of a mess, but you can see they're fruiting. That one's called Olymp Olympia. It's supposed to be one of the biggest figs. Uh, we just brought it in to try to see if it's any good. A lot of times the big figs aren't all that great. Uh, we have another one that we're growing called GE Neri. And uh, also similar brown turkey type figs. Uh, both of those are supposed to be tennis ball sized fruit. So really big fruit. But we don't know if they're any good. So we just brought them in to try them. If they turn out good, we'll propagate them. Otherwise, they'll just trial run. Now some of the other names you'll see out there, uh, LSU Purple. So this is something that Louisiana State University created for the deep south, the high humidity, a lot of rain. Um, it turns out that that's in a lot of people's top ten list. So we carry LSU Purple out there. Um, I think that's about all the ones I have in right now. Now some of the ones that we'll have next year, so the top rated fig in the world usually is Black Madeira. So 
from the island of Madeira off of Africa. Um, Black Madeira and White Madeira are in a lot of people's top ten lists. We've eaten both of those. They're not that different from a normal pig, and they're small. So again, a lot of the top rated pigs are small because they handle the bad weather better. They're sweet, they're mild, they're small, they're good, but they're not anything exceptional as far as, you know, we've eaten them for a year now, and it's like, oh, okay. But that is the top rated pig. So apparently it just puts up with the bad climate better. And then there's Black Ischia. This one's a neat one for collectors because on the internet they sell pieces of the stem for like $300. Oh. So last year we had collectors coming in and wanting the one I had in the back called Black Issue. We warned them, this is not Black Issue, it's the food are coming out green, so we know it's not the right one. But they want it because they can sell it on the internet for $300, $400 on eBay or something. So it's like, yeah, uh, that's a scam. So we black issue, we've eaten that one, it's okay. It's like a slight between a brown turkey and a black mission. Oh, another one that we have out there. No, I, I think we're out of stock this year. Um, these are from France, and it's Mr. Sorte Grise. Uh, they said it's the top, one of the top selling pigs in England. And so we have we have a mother plant of that too. We had a few plants for sale this year, but I think we're sold out for this year. But that's a brown turkey-like fig that's quite good. It may be one of the better brown turkey type figs we've eaten. So that one we'll have next year. Um, anyway, just some of the names that you'll come up with. Smith's fig is top rated. Um, there's a lot of like. I don't know, my Gary Strawberry has made it into some internet list. <laughs> so it's, it's quite neat to see this. Any, any questions on fix? Care and maintenance. Pardon? Care and maintenance, fertilizing and watering. They said they don't like a lot of fertilizing. Well, you don't need to fertilize them a lot. They tend to grow like a weed. So what, when you plant them in the ground and you take care of them for a year, it's like from that point on, you just pick and prune. <laughs> yeah, right. They're like mulberries. The roots are so wide spreading so quickly that they find, they seem to be able to find their own water. Now they're still needing it. Like in a pot, we have to water figs a lot because they're using a lot, the big leaves are so big, they're using a lot of water on a hot day, so they'll just wilt on us. Uh, but in the ground, they seem to be able to find it. Oh, they can just really Well, if you want your figs not to split. It's better to keep them on the wet side. So, you know, wet dry cycles make the fruit swell up and shrink and swell up and shrink. So you get a lot of splitting going on. I remember uh, my first house, I didn't know much about growing fruit at that time. And every single one of my blackjack figs would just split open like a flower before it was ripe. And that's because uh, in that spot of my yard, the soil was so sandy. You'd water, be wet, and it would be totally dry by the next day and you water it's totally wet wet dry wet dry the things just split open on me couldn't get a single ripe fruit on that one so that's they want to keep them on the wet side if possible so figs when we grow them in pots we use our acid potting soil which has more peat in it because it'll hold moisture better than our other one does so that's what we do but uh, yeah and you got to keep them on uh, consistently moist for better fruit quality for better size and not and not and avoid some of that splitting. Uh, keep them on the wet side. Um, I mean, the other way is keep it on the dry side, but it's easier to keep on the wet side. Like they say with with grapes, they want to keep them on the dry side, the vineyard, the wine grapes, so they don't get so big they're more concentrated. And on pomegranates, the, the farmers don't want to keep them too wet because they tend to split at the very end of the season if you keep them too wet. But we find it's not being too wet, it's if they're dry and then they get wet, then they, they tend to split. So it's better to, like navel oranges said, the, um, you get a lot of splitting this time of year. So the navel orange growers keep their water 110% of what they're supposed to. 
from August to November to prevent flooding because you can lose your entire crop if they get too dry, they shrink, and then it rains, they just blow open. So you want to keep them full of water so they don't shrink on you and then split with the next rain safely that way. How do you store your figs? Because you, they're pretty prolific, so um, you can't eat them all. You, I don't uh, store them. Uh, you can refrigerate them for a few days. Just a few days. Yeah, or you can dry them. Sometimes you can dry them. Yeah. Yeah. So do you either have to eat them or dry them? Right? Yeah. Well, I guess you can cook them. I had a friend, my Italian friend used to make all kinds of stuff. We used to get cake and cookies from him and everything. Yeah. How do you prune this? Well, during the year, we don't need to do much pruning, although it doesn't hurt the tree. You prune it here, they just start growing branches. And then those branches usually have figs on them too. And but you will take the time to prune. Um, so we usually do all our pruning on figs uh, December, January. December. Okay. Now is the time to grow the fruits. Yeah, the fruits. Fruits in full production right now. Oh. October, yeah. November. And so I go to my friend's house who grows uh, black missions in January, and his trees will be like 20 foot tall. All this ripe fruit near the top, you just cut them and then you can pick the fruit and eat it off the top of the tree at that time. Okay, yeah. Uh, can we cross a different diet in one? It's possible, but it's not easy because of the latex that they have. That, that sap that comes out, that milky sap, makes it hard to draft. Um, I would say they take a lot of cuttings and grow them in the same pot. Just like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you said take cuttings, two eyes, uh, but you're only putting one eye in the soil. We like to bury them. Now, fig cuttings dry out fairly easily, so we like to bury them and just leave the top eye exposed. So you put one eye in the soil? The At least one eye in the soil and leave one eye out of the top of the dirt. But if you leave them too high, our air is so dry that the the thing just shrivels up. Oh, so to make sure that the one exposed is not very high. Up. Right. Now, some years it's moist enough, no problem. This last year it was kind of dry again, so you lost a lot of cuttings if you leave them, you know, if you don't have a pot that's deep enough and they're stinking up and they dry up. Um, if you have a greenhouse, no problem. You just put them in the greenhouse in a pot. Um, now, figs, just so you know, you can take cutting any time of the year, it seems, with leaves on them and no matter what, and do a cutting, and they usually make it. So a friend of mine in August once, he took cuttings off his black mission, threw them in a pot, I go over there, all the leaves are wilted down, I thought, ah, no way, well, it's all wilted, and the stems are filling up. Go there two weeks later, they're all growing. <laughs> so, uh, they're strong plants. So, you know, if you're eating a lot of figs, there is latex in the skin. So they said if you're eating, if you plan to eat a lot of figs, don't eat the skin. Because by about the 10th fig, your lip starts to buzz from the latex. So just, just peel the skin away and eat the flesh inside. But that doesn't bother me too much. Okay, I might think of a few more things to sell you, but we'll switch to pomegranates. So the center of the pomegranate world is Turkey. However, the scientists believe that pomegranates all evolved in India. So in the continent of India, uh, several races developed. The ones toward the Sierras in northern India are the deciduous, normal temperate climate pomegranates. The ones in southern India became the tropical pomegranates. And the one tropical that you might know, you see those little plants in people's yards as a hedge, the dwarf pomegranate, which blooms and fruits year-round with a little fruit like this. Uh, that 
that's one of the tropical ones that blooms and fruits year round. Now those little pomegranates on the dwarf ones, they call it Punica granatum nana as a botanical name, those are edible. They're small, they're sweet, they're fine. Uh, you can't eat those. So that little thing makes flowers and fruit year round. If it gets too cold, it will drop its, its leaves, but it'll, it'll still survive and put on new growth the next year. So the regular temperate climate pomegranates and there are more than one race of these too. Um, the soft seed ones and then the hard seed ones. So the original, the most common pomegranate at the store is Wonderful, called Wonderful. And that's the hard seed type. And the thing about the hard seed ones, they handle the cold climates better. This happens to be Ariana, which is a soft seed type, and they won't grow, they won't take anything below, say, 10 degrees or so, they won't go that cold. So, like in the Midwest, well, in the center of the country, you can't grow Ariana's any further inland than, say, Houston. Because it's so cold there in the winter time. Um, whereas wonderful go all the way, I think, toward Kansas, it'll make it. It won't go, you know, it's nothing like apples can go in Minnesota, but wonderful can take a lot more cold. Um, in stock right now, we only have two hard seed ones, uh, our, uh, wonderful and Austin, which is another hard seed. And those uh, Austin named for Austin, Texas, is actually from Syria, brought to, from Syria to Austin by a Syrian immigrant. And uh, in Texas, they consider this one to be the finest pomegranate that they can grow there. Uh, I have not eaten one of these, so I don't know what, what makes it finer. They said it's bigger fruit, better tasting than wonderful. The hard seed ones handle the cold butter, but they also are the ones you, that you can juice. The soft seed ones, the seeds get all squishy and they get messed up in the juice. So, the hard seed ones you juice. Now, the company who grew Austin's for us is out of business now, so this might be my last plot, crop of Austin's. We might try propagating some ourselves. If we, now I never eat the fruit, I don't know if it's worth it or not. Anyway, the, uh, that one. And then the soft seed ones. Um, and I'm getting some more pomegranates in the little starter containers in about a month and a half. And that'll be Ariana, Park, Bianca. And these are all from a uh, Russian collection. That's the soft seed. Yes. Dessert me I. Dessert me. Oops. Yeah, I think that's what it's This was the Russian collection. They brought over a whole bunch. So one, uh, Dr. Gregory Levine in Russia, Jewish immigrant to Russia, had collected a bunch of pomegranates over 40 years throughout the Middle East. He was collecting all the best ones. They were in a, one of the Russian field stations near the southern edge of Russia. And he called up all the universities of the world back in the early 80s saying, we're losing, we lost our funding, Russia's falling apart, you know, Soviet Union's falling apart at that time, they needed to summon to house their collection. So they brought, I think they said 30 of them over to UC Davis. In the late 80s, they had the first taste off with the Russian collection versus the ones that were in the US. And they said the Russian ones took the top seven spots. So they started growing them at that time um, generally, Ariana Parfianca rated one and two at any contest. They said these two will take first or second place. Uh, the difference between these and the wonderful, the seeds are small and they're soft. And you barely notice that they're there. Now, in the U.S., at the, that time, the top rated one was ever sweet. was a, and it's still, some people recommend it, 
uh, soft seed, mild flesh, almost clear flesh. But the Eversweet, the seeds are big. So they, you notice them when you're eating them, even though they're soft, they're big and they're not real sweet. They're kind of bitter. Because I've grown ever, I grew Eversweet in the 90s when it was, when it first, you know, when it was being when it was popular. <clears throat> and the seeds were big and soft, uh, but kind of bitter, so I didn't really like it. Um, but the Russian series, small, soft seeds, barely notice them. Flesh, nice colored flesh, strongly flavored. Uh, now, Park Young, uh, they said, is uh, the proper balance between sweet and tart, right in the middle there, between being too tart, too sweet. Uh, you know, things that are too sweet are kind of bland. Things that are too tart are like wonderful, kind of a tart one. They said Parfalca is kind of a wine flavored one that's right in the middle there, dark red flush. Ariana, if you like wonderful, you might like Ariana better because it's just slightly to the tart side of that perfect balance line. So, but these two tend to win all the taste tests. Down in Florida a couple years ago, they had a taste test uh, with all the Florida varieties and they brought a couple of these over from California to, to check it out. California ones beat all the all the Florida ones. Um, I think Ariana took the top honors in Florida, and Jasarsky was right up there too. Now Jasarsky, of of these, I've eaten dessert on Jasarsky. We keep selling these too fast. I never get to eat the fruit, but Jasarsky, I ate the fruit on that one, and the book says it. it will remind you a lot of lemonade. We're thinking, well, how can that be? It's a sweet pomegranate. So a customer I ate one of these, and it was sweet, but it had a finishing kick that was really neat. Just like when you eat, drink lemonade, when you swallow it, it gets you right in the throat. That astringency in there it gets you right in the throat. This one did the same thing. We thought, boy, this is the best pomegranate we've ever eaten. So Jasarsky, I would really like. Unfortunately, Dave Wolf is not selling these this coming year. I'm not sure if they quit growing it or not. But we still have some plants out there of Jasarsky. I don't know, there's a few left. But that was quite good, we thought. Quite good. The best one I've eaten of the Russian ones so far. But again, I haven't eaten Ariana Parfialka yet. Uh, Dave Wilson Nursery brought out a whole bunch of these in the 80s, but they renamed them, and that was a mistake. So when they didn't have their Russian names on them, then no one knew what they were selling and they didn't sell well. So when they finally put the Russian names back on them, they started becoming really, really popular. And you know, we're bringing in close to 100 of these this in next month uh, and about 50 of these or so because they, that's how well they sell. Okay. Now we do have something we need that one of my neighbors brought. So they were in Singapore about 20 years ago and they had a pomegranate in Singapore and it was <coughs> sweet and soft seeds. So they brought the seeds back to California. I guess he, he's the importer, I guess he smuggled the seeds in. Um, and he grew a pomegranate in his backyard and it turned out to be evergreen and ever blooming just like the dwarf ones. Um, this is a, now this is a small fruit off one of the pots. His fruit are full size, but they they bloom year round, fruit year round, and it's evergreen. So this would be a nice ornamental edible. Um, this one, this this one we did from a cutting last summer, just starting to flower, and the fruit will just turn out fine. Um, but they're soft seeded, sweet. The seeds aren't necessarily small, but they're good. All all his relatives wanted plants of this. He, this one's difficult to propagate. Regular pomegranates, when they're dormant, you take cuttings as big as pencils, and they, they're supposed to be pretty easy, although I haven't tried it yet. This one is a pain. Uh, my neighbor tried to propagate it from cuttings, tried over and over and over, can never get one to take. Uh, so we've been doing them for him, but boy, we take 100 cuttings and get 10. A large <laughs> A large thing. That's a regular pomegranate. So his. My neighbor's tree is, a, they keep theirs in a raised bed and it's about eight by eight. Uh, but it's always, you know, there's always, you can go out there any day and pick 10 fruit that are ripe. So it's an amazing plant. We have one, this one is from one in a 15 gallon buckets, only this big because we take taking cuttings off it. But it's got about, uh, you know, a dozen of these on there. 
um, and usually they get bigger. This was off a little branch off the bottom, but uh, quite good. And you can do it any time of the year. In fact, um, we had one cutting once that before the you know it was this big in the winter, and before the end of the year it had fruit on it that were ripening. That fast. I mean. Regular pomegranates, it seems like it can take any up to about five years to start production. But because this thing can flower year round, and, and heat seems to be a key on pomegranates. Uh, 2013, 2014, that winter, it was one of the warmest winters we can remember, or warmest spring, like 90 degrees every day in spring. We noticed that every, almost every single pomegranate tree, no matter if it was one foot tall, two foot tall, had fruit on it that year. And then the next year, 2015, was one of the cloudiest springs we've ever had. Only two trees made fruit. Now this year at the nursery, only about five made fruit. It was another cloudy spring. So it seems like the heat in the spring, sunlight and heat in the spring make them help promote flowering and fruiting. Older trees have no trouble. They got enough energy reserves. They can still do it on a cloudy year. But the young trees seem to be dependent on a nice hot spring to, to fruit when they're young. Now this thing never has any problems because it's flowering and fruiting all year. So we always get some more warm weather during the year so it seems to start up and produce really early no matter what. Would it be used, can it be used as a pollinator for something else? Probably, it blooms all the time. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what those seeds make though. You might get an evergreen, that's what we're thinking, you know, Cross these with some of the Russian ones, see if you get a dark, because this is kind of a light red. Some of the Russian ones have you know, darker red and stronger flavor. It'd be interesting to see if you can develop one that's uh, a little bit better flavored than this, but these certainly are, are good to eat. So. Anyway, we, we've sold quite a few of these this year, have two for sale in a five gun, but we really jack up the price on making twice as expensive as those, because <laughs> it is, I mean, half, you know, part of greenhouse is just dedicated to trying to grow these things, and it's not easy. Can you what throw them out? Oh, we call it Aaron, E-R-I-N. Can it be grown in a pot? Oh, yeah. yeah fit, our 15-gallon pot out there can make 20, 30 fruit a year. We had one in a 24-inch box here uh, a year ago, and so one of our customers bought it, and it had about, you uh, six or seven ripe ones on it at the moment we sold it, but it was flowering and fruiting. So they do well in pots. I'm sure you'll get less splitting in the ground than you will in a pot unless you can put an automatic water system on to keep it moist all the time. So they will drop their leaves if it gets cold enough. We haven't had a winter cold enough for these to drop their leaves. Now my neighbor who grows this says they've got rats in their yard. And to protect the fruit, they just wrap the top of it in aluminum foil so the rats can't figure it out. The top half is covered in aluminum foil. That might work on other fruit. Does that work for squirrels on that? Well? Might. Oh, yeah. Yeah, squirrels come through. Yeah. One of our other customers uh, who grows a lot of figs, he, he bought these little uh, bags. Uh, nylon bag <laughs> with the pull string on them. He puts them around the fig fan on the tree. Oh, you see that, Joe? Yeah. When you said the top half, yeah, show me what that is. Well, they just no on, on the pomegranate. Yeah, yeah, so they're hanging like this. They just put one sheet of foam foil and covered the top half. But they said that was good enough to keep the rats from figuring out what it is. God, how did they get it? I mean, gee. Every pomegranate they get. That they want to eat. Not at the base so that they can't run up. No, their tree's too short. They would perhaps could jump from the wall behind it. Yeah. Um, there's one other thing we're, uh, pomegranate we're getting into, pink satin, which is supposed to taste like fruit punch with soft seeds also. So besides, so there are some other sources of soft-seeded pomegranates that are good, but we don't uh, we don't promote the Eversweet. All some other nurseries still sell Eversweet because the seeds were big, even though they're soft. And there's one called Sweet out there too, which is fairly soft, pink flesh, uh, soft seeds. But that one's kind of bland. We like 
I mean, the Russian ones do have a much more pronounced flavor. So those are the main ones we're getting in. The small trees we're getting in will be about this tall in pots that are four inches across uh, in next month. But in fact, this is one of the smallest ones left in that group. So we potted them last fall. And some of the ones we have uh, in 15 gallon on our growing grounds that would plant out seven feet. So they grew about four and a half feet in one year. So they grow at a good rate. Even though they're real tiny when you get them, they do well. They can be pruned all year round to keep size. Yeah, now pomegranates, um, we've seen a lot of literature on, on how to train them. So a lot of the, what pomegranates tend to do when you plant them in the ground, even if you start with one stem, they tend to throw a lot of stems from the dirt yeah. for a long time. <coughs> keep them cut off. Um, most orchards work with between one and they said five trunks. They don't want to go much more than five because the thickness of the trunk determines the strength of that trunk and the stronger they are, the thicker they are, the better they fruit. All this little tiny whip-like stuff coming out doesn't flower or fruit very well. So it's better not to keep that around. All of trees do exactly the same thing. They throw out a whole bunch of stems from the dirt. You got to keep clipping them off for a while. They stop doing it after a while. Now pomegranates can live, I think the book says 500 years. They have some real old ones in the Middle East. But they said their best production is the first 50 years of their life. And their very best production may be in the best first 30 years of their life. So. Any questions on the pomegranate? Oh, we, we do sell this for 70 bucks. <laughs> or 80 bucks. 80 bucks, I think. Sweet. It's like a, like a 12 foot long. But uh, the pomegranates are, are pretty much kind of big, like this. But it's so sour. I can't I mean, handle eating one. They crack open and they're very red, but sour as lemon. Well, there are some sour varieties out there. So apparently, this. You know, it's, I don't know that it's any cultural thing you're doing. I think it's just a variety. There are some really tart ones out there. One of the things is that it's, it's against a, a huge wall of building, and there's no food plus exposure throughout the day. So probably, no, lack of sunlight. So you think that might be the issue? I heard that you mentioned that it's a lot of sun. Right? Yeah, they do like it hot for better production and everything, and more sun, more sweetness. More too. sweetness. Probably that's going to be one of the issues in that. Right? Uh, but the seeds, fertilizer. I haven't seen anything really written about feeding them that much. Uh, at my own house, barely fed them. Um, we fed them initially the first year, and then after that, we just didn't do much, and they seem to produce this fine. Now, the books do say you can increase production quite a, significantly by having more than one variety. So if you only have one pomegranate tree, there's, they're partially self-fertile like a lot of apples are. So you get a bigger crop and better quality fruit if you can cross it with something else. Now, this one's got no, there's no other pomegranate blooms here around it. Well, the dwarf one does. So if you put a dwarf one next to the big one, you might get slightly bigger fruit, slightly bit more fruit, um, since the dwarf one is related to that. Yeah. How do you know when I, th I think I have a wonderful, it's hard to, how do you know when the fruit is right? I never could tell. You just pick it, pick it at the right time. Well, each one is supposed to have a certain time. Like most of the Russian ones ripen early. And uh, they ripen by late summer. But the wonderful is a longer uh, late season fruit. So usually November, uh, October, no late October, November, you can pick it. Usually it's good by that time. They, they seem to hold on a tree a long time, though. I used, I waited. This year I have trouble with rats. But up until then, I just, around Halloween, it would crack open. And then I figured, good, you can cut them. But this year's more challenging with rats. And I don't know, you know, I, I want to leave them on so they get as sweet as possible. Right, right. But, uh, you know, I've got a challenge. Now rats, one other method we tell people about is the bubble gum. So, uh, 
try that one. Uh, blue gum smart and final hours by the double bubble bubble gum in the big bag. Seven bucks for hundreds of them. Unwrap them, set them out, out there where your dog can't get them. The rats eat them, it kills them. Oh, you well, don't even know. use a trap? Kills them. We couldn't believe how fast they die. Because <laughs> It doesn't, really? it doesn't digest, and if one rat eats one piece of bubblegum, that's like you eating this much. <laughs> you know, it sits in your stomach and doesn't move. And we found, my, so we find, you know, we thought this is a silly idea, how could it kill them? Yeah. But last year we finally tried it, put some on the wall so our dog couldn't pick any up. And two days later I found two dead rats and a mouse on the sidewalk, so I could kill them that quick. They're just wow. laying dead on the sidewalk. Double bubbles, bubble gum. Yeah. The, the double bubbles, not dentine or anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't like, you know, rodents don't like, don't like anything minty. Okay. So it's got, you know, the double bubbles is sugary. <laughs> and I, and I've used uh, juicy fruit juicy too. Fruit? Yeah, no. And that works too. Uh, but I was amazed that it worked. Rats and mice. Uh, so far, we haven't seen dead squirrels, so may not get squirrels. Yeah. But we heard the first thing we heard was it worked on gophers. Uh, okay. This kills them because they it doesn't digest, and within a couple of days they starve to death. Apparently. These are not all toxins. Right. So if an owl ate them, you know they don't eat the stomach contents, so they would it would be safer for them to eat too. Okay. Wow. So, so fruit, fruit form on the new growth or like Interestingly, um, yeah, pomegranates form on new growth. Mm -hmm. At the tips, it says. We know because the air in pomegranate, you started cutting this big, by the end of the year it's four or five foot tall with fruit all over it. It's like, where'd that come from? <laughs> There's no old wood there. It just forms. So pomegranates apparently can come to the dirt and they'll still flower and fruit, but it's more, it's better to leave the big trunks on them because that's where a lot of energy is, but they do bloom and fruit off of new growth. Have you ever experienced seeing these little bugs that look like grasshoppers, but they're like yay big on the pomegranate trees? Have you ever seen them? Definitely on the fruit. Yeah, on the fruit. Mm -hmm. Haven't noticed that. Now there's a lot of bugs that like broken fruit. Not too many bugs will get fruit that's not broken, except for some fruit flies. Yeah, those are very interesting because this is my, my daughter's uh, house has a pomegranate tree, and it's the same bug that is huh. on her neighbors. And I have a pomegranate in my house too, and it's the same little black beetle type, uh, but they just Brown the fruit, especially on uh, this one. Oh, uh, it's the same bud, um, and I just thought that might be something for just pomegranates. I haven't seen that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing we noted too during the years is in my own, my last house I lived at, we planted our pomegranates in a group for the pollination, but it turned out to be the lowest part of our yard that doesn't drain. So one of the El Nino years, they were underwater for three months. Didn't hurt them at all. <laughs> I was amazed because we lost persimmons, we lost plum trees, cherry trees to root rot, and the pomegranates never flinched, so they can stay underwater. Apparently, even though they're drought-tolerant plants, they can handle the wet soil. So that was an eye-opener to us. We thought, yeah, no way they would survive being in a pond like that, but they sat in there and were fine. Who's turned out fine? Okay, any other questions today? The pomegranate trees we'll be getting in, so we do have some, a few big ones left out there. Uh, the small pots will be uh, $20 when they come, and that's in uh, about five weeks, five weeks. Will they come in a small pot? Or they? Yeah, they come in those uh, nine inch by four inch by four inch. Did you got some now, or you? you... No, I don't have any. I have. Uh, some pots, but I don't have any plants. Those are just propagation pots that you can start the cutting. You said they're 80 bucks, but you say 80 bucks for that. Yeah, this one, this, the Aaron pomegranate is oh, that's, that's the 79.99 because we have to grow hundreds to get one. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Do they also come with small boxes? No, oh no, we're not, well, I would sell them for eighty dollars, no matter what size they are, because it's that hard to get them to start. We spent a lot of time trying to grow this thing, and it's it's been, it's been you know it's easy to grow the plants, it's hard to make a new one. Right, propagation. No, these are all uh, self-fertile with no, you know, there's, the wasp would have to do the pollination, but most of them have closed eyes, so the wasp can't even get in there, so they're just self-fertile. If you can put like two rags and things together and be able to help each other. True, they, they should not help each other. It's like navel oranges, you got no seeds, they're totally self-fertile. Now, you see that is a little deciduous, is that uh, only? No, it's totally evergreen. Totally evergreen. Well, at least the last uh, five years, they, just, well, they haven't dropped a single leaf. We just started propagating these about five years ago, and it's been really tough. <laughs> yeah. I have an area where we do something fairly ornamental, but on it, I'll keep it probably less than five feet tall. Pardon? Well, we keep it, if I had it, I put it in a pot and keep it about five feet tall. Yeah, yeah ours are fruiting at this height, so mm -hmm. no fruit. So I have two of these available in this size container, and that's it right now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.